This video was actually inspired by the last video we filmed. In the last video, we looked at a particular object. It was Abel 1 for deep sky videos. And you asked me, why is this number one? And I said, well, it's got the lowest coordinates in the catalog. It's the closest to zero. And that sparked an idea. And I, I thought to myself, hang on a second. Is there anything out there at zero comma zero in celestial coordinates? So I went looking. We probably want to define our coordinate systems. And it gets a little bit complicated because we are, of course, on the Earth. The Earth is spinning, it's moving around the Sun, and of course, as we've discussed many times before, everything else is moving as well. It turns out that as cute as this guy is, he's surprisingly not very geographically accurate. So instead, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go to, to this little thing. We're pretty familiar with coordinate systems on the Earth. We've got lines of latitude that go from the North Pole to the South Pole, going in this direction around the Earth, and of course, the equator is the one in the middle. It's the, the largest, and it, it marks the zero point of latitude. So we go up to 90 and down to minus 90. And then perpendicular to that, at a right angle, even though this is a sphere, we've got the lines connecting North and South Pole, and those are the lines of longitude. But then the question comes, well, where do you decide where zero is? You don't have an obvious reference point like with latitude, so you have to pick something. The Earth is constantly spinning, there's no special point in longitude that's going to help us pick a zero point. And so this video is not going to be about the history of meridians because we could go down an entire rabbit hole, but I'll just say that the current agreed definition of zero degrees longitude is the meridian that runs through Greenwich. This wasn't always the case. There were different meridians. There's one in Paris, and in fact, just last week, I was at the Paris Observatory, and you could see the Paris Meridian lined out in front of you. It's only a matter of time before a certain someone puts it in America as well. Uh, we won't go there. Yeah. We won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there, we have our coordinate system on Earth. And so then the question arises, well, what's at zero, zero? What's at the intersection of the prime meridian, zero degrees longitude, and the equator, zero degrees latitude. I don't know the answer to that. I know, I thought this would be fun to look at. Oh, well, that's amazing, I've no, I can't believe I've never wondered that. What is it, where is it? Well, where do you think it is, Brady? <laughs> I'm a guessing Africa? Yeah, it's just off the coast of Africa. It's in the Gulf of Guinea. The nearest country is Ghana. I think it's a few hundred kilometers uh, away. So you can't really go and stand there. Oh, but you're gonna love this, Brady. There is something there. They've put a buoy right there, a little oceanographic floating thing that marks the spot of zero comma zero. I think in cartography circles, it's called Null Island. How cool. I know. I, I, wanna, I wanna go there. I thought that was a really neat thing. So and then the question I wanted to ask is, is there something equivalent in space? And so now we have to switch from our terrestrial coordinate system to our celestial coordinate system, although they are tied together. Um, and that's because we are observing the sky from Earth. The Earth is spinning and that sets up some, just like with latitude, sets up some natural ways in which we can measure coordinates. So if you take the equator and you project it out into space, you get the celestial equator. And if you take the North and South Pole and you project them up in space, you get the North Celestial Pole and the South Celestial Pole. Of course, all of that is then moving over time scales of thousands of years because the Earth's axis is processing in this sort of wobble, but we won't mention that just now. So that gives us sort of an equator in the sky uh, that we can measure. We, instead of calling latitude, we call it declination. Then we get the same problem as we had with longitude where do we start zero in the other direction? And we don't call it longitude, we call it right ascension. And we don't measure it in degrees, we measure it in hours. And that's because of the motion of the sky. So we had to decide on a zero point. And of course you couldn't use the prime meridian on Earth because that is spinning all the time relative to the stars. Yeah, but it's close. We, we do actually tie in the prime meridian to this definition. Because what's happening over the course of the year is that the apparent position of the sun is moving through the sky. So if you take a picture of the sun at the same time every day, 
it's going to trace out a very famous figure of eight. And at the pinch point of the eight is where the sun crosses from the south celestial hemisphere to the north celestial hemisphere. And that is equivalent to when it crosses the equator. And so what we do is we pick a date. We say the March equinox is when the sun passes from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. And this happens to be the intersection between the celestial equator that I mentioned and the plane of the ecliptic, which is where all of the planets are aligned in a plane. And of course, that's why we see the sun cross at that point. So there is a definition, it is motivated physically, but we do have to make a decision to tie it down to a spe specific point in time. And the point in time we choose is the March equinox. So this point actually has a name. It's called the first point of Aries. And the symbol for it is like the symbol for Aries, the little ram. Now we'll tie it back to Earth. Let's imagine we went on a trip and we visited our little floating boy, right? And there was a nice platform there. We could lay back and watch the, the sun pass through the sky. At noon on the vernal equinox in March, we would see the sun directly overhead. So we would not cast a shadow. That's the point on Earth where the, the, the sun would be directly overhead on the vernal equinox. Okay, so now we've tied this all together. But my question is, okay, the sun's there on a particular date. What's behind the sun? Is there anything out there that we've looked at, that we've cataloged, that we can find in our archives with coordinates zero comma zero? Okay, so I thought I'd let you in on how we sort of would approach this problem using the tools at our disposal. I'm a, an astronomer that generally looks at things outside our own galaxy. So my first port of call is NED and this is the NASA Extragalactic Database. So I put the coordinates zero comma zero in, and this is what it came out with. So here's a list of objects from closest to that point going to further away. And the top one, the object name is WISE. And that gives me a clue that it's an infrared source. WISE is an infrared telescope, and indeed the object type is in IRS, infrared source. And it gives the coordinates here, and you can see that although it's close to zero comma zero, it's not exactly at zero comma zero. It's at zero hours, zero minutes, and 1.3 seconds, and a declination of minus zero degrees, zero minutes, and 11 seconds. That's not what we were looking for. We want something bang on. Let's look closer to home then. So the other database that uh, you might think to use is called Sinbad. And there's just sort of historical reasons that these two things have developed because Sinbad was kind of a, a catalog of stars and, and most of the stars we see are in our own galaxy. Ned was for all the stuff out there. So in Sinbad, I put the coordinates in and got a similar list. And then I got excited because I see something here with zero, zero point zero, right ascension and zero 0 0.00 declination. And it's a Fermi source. So Fermi is a gamma ray telescope. So that's something exciting. That's a gamma ray burst. That's maybe a, a collision of two neutron stars or the explosion of a hypernova at the end of a massive star's lifetime. So I thought this was going to be a really good story. And I could say, right, look, Brady, there's a gamma, or there was a gamma ray burst. It will have come and gone by now at this point. But Brady, I'm, an, I'm a scientist and I'm skeptical and the alarm bell started ringing. It's too perfect. It's too perfect. Uh, so the next thing I would do is to go and check the source. That's what we would do. This is the only paper that this source appears in in the literature. And it is a list of gamma ray sources from Fermi. No surprise. So if we search for that particular object, we see this is the right ascension, 0.0, .0 declination, 0.0. .0. This column is the error on the, on, the, on the position. And we're always interested in the error bars. And this is where I got even more suspicious because the error was 0.0. .0. So I thought, okay, uh, I'm not so confident that I can go and swim with Brady and say, ta-da, we found a gamma burst because I don't know if that's really real. So what do I do now? I'm not an expert in gamma ray burst or transient objects, you know, things that come and go in the sky, um, but I know people who are. So I sent an email last night to an astronomer I know. This is Professor Neil Tanvir, 
who works on gamma ray bursts and transient objects at the University of Leicester, who is an expert on these things, and asked, could you verify, am I right to be suspicious of this? And he replied kindly and did confirm to me that, yes, you're right to be suspicious. Sometimes, and I hadn't thought about this, because this kind of astronomy is, is transient astronomy. So they don't know where their sources are going to be. They get an alert and literally like a, a pager or a phone goes off and people around the world slew their telescopes to different objects uh, to follow them up. And he said that actually quite often zero comma zero gets passed down the chain because people forget to actually update the coordinates from the default. But it's still a little confusing why that would get into a published paper. And in fact, he did another favor and he went and looked at the official list of Fermi targets and that's no longer there. So clearly somewhere along the way, something went wrong. It's been removed from the catalog, but it made it into this paper. It's almost like a typo, like a, you know, it's a mistake that got through. But these things happen and this is data. This is data science. So if you, if you can allow me to wax philosophical for a minute, this is a, an issue that we face now as a field. We are now really data rich. We've got these big surveys that are producing all of these anonymous results and sources. Um, and a huge amount of effort goes into, before releasing those publicly, to making them clean and well documented so that people who are that much further removed from the process and don't know all the, you know, subtleties and little quirks to, be, to watch out for so they, they can safely use it. Um, but it does mean that sometimes that either you don't know how to make the right selection or something gets through which is why we can't just blindly trust any catalog that we happen to download. We have to, as we do with everything, interrogate it really carefully, really critically, look for outliers, look for funny things that might indicate that something's wrong. And I've actually gone through this myself. So I, I ran a big survey for a while and our team, we, we released all of our data to the astronomical community, including all of the catalogs that we created. And we actually had a meeting where we all got together and we tried for a couple of days to break the catalog to find things that were wrong with it before we, we, we passed it on to, to the rest of the community. Is there anything at zero, zero? So, well, it, there might be, but we haven't seen it yet if it's there. Haven't That's you, the answer. Haven't you got like surveys like WikiSky and all these websites where you can just go to a place and look there? Well, yes, we do, Brady, so yeah. let me show you. Right. Uh, we've got something called Aladdin. Down the left here, you've got all these different surveys that it's got imaging for. So I've typed in zero comma zero, and you can see the lines here that show the intersection of the right ascension and declination. So where that little purple cross is, is indeed zero comma zero. So right now we're showing the digitized sky survey too. And we'll zoom in, and in fact, Nothing there on the digitized sky survey. And now we can go through different wavelengths. So Fermi was our gamma ray telescope, and that just looks like a big blob because we're in the noise. Yeah. Okay, so there's, there's Fermi. So that was where we were hopeful that there was something, um, but actually there's not. In the X-ray from XMM, well, it just haven't, hasn't covered that patch of sky, nothing in Chandra. DESI Legacy Survey, which is a really deep optical survey. Now we see way more objects, really, really beautiful. But even so, when we zoom in, Ugh. maybe maybe there's a hint of something nearby, but um, nothing right on target. But yeah, I think this, this shows an illustration of sort of the tools that we have at our disposal and also just allows us to answer the question, do we see anything at zero comma zero? You were telling me that as various things change, this point in the sky, this, this Aries point, will move. Mm. So presumably it's going to leave behind the point where we've currently traced our meridian in space. Like, what do we do about that? Is, there, is it updated from time to time? or do we, we, Obviously we have to decide the coordinates and keep them, otherwise all our databases will fall out of sync. Like, how do we deal with the, the problem that this point moves? Yeah, exactly. If we tie the coordinates to a particular epoch, even if uh, the first point is starting to move. Um, but if eventually they'll get so out of sync that you need to do a correction, much like with a leap year, right? And so then you just, then 
we, we switch our astronomical epoch. And so I think that's only happened in modern astronomy once, that we were working with 1950 coordinates for a while, and then we switched to 2000 coordinates, and then at some point in the future, presumably the International Astronomical Union will decide we, you need to decide on a new baseline once again. So, of course, you probably want to know what, what three words is for our little buoy in the center of the, the ocean. Um, so it, for people who don't know, this is a project that has divided the entire surface of the Earth into squares of three meters by three meters and has designated a combination of three English words to act as a coordinate system. Okay, so it's just an easier way of communicating locations rather than remembering all of these digits. So if you put in zero comma zero to what three words, the three words are prosecuted amplification showings. And so I can, I can prove it if we zoom out, we have to zoom out quite a long way from our little boy just sitting in the ocean. And there it is on the equator off the coast of Africa. What a shame it wasn't on land, but we can't control these things. I kind of like that it's a little, that they actually put something there, though. Oh, that's cool. That's kind of neat. Yeah, that is cool. That's very cool. Thanks for watching. There'll be some links down below on screen in the comments to more 60 Symbols videos, but I'll also put links to my other channels. Have you ever seen Deep Sky videos? Number file. Objectivity. What about the Unmade podcast? There are all sorts of interesting things going on. I'd love you to check them out. You might like some of it and maybe even subscribe. Thanks a lot.